I am very pleased to welcome back to the show congressional candidate running in Georgia's 7th Congressional District, Nabil Islam. Welcome back to The Damage Report. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Uh, glad to have you back on. Uh, you are the, the first candidate, as I was telling you before we went live, that we've had on with this you know, situation that we're dealing with. And um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to find out how all of this is affecting you. I mean, you are treading new water. What is it like campaigning with the current state of the country? Uh, yes, it is de very different. Um, I was actually one of the first candidates in my state to suspend all-in-person canvassing uh, because we just didn't feel like it was safe to put my staff, my volunteers, and my community um, at risk of this virus, which is very contagious. Um, and so being a grassroots candidate and having um, our activity, or most of our activity door-to-door -door and face-to-face, -face, um, it's been a real uh, change. Uh, we are moving everything to being virtual. Um, and so we're doubling down on text banking and phone banking. We're having our first virtual town hall coming up so that People still have are accessible to our campaign and can ask me questions right now. Um, we're so we're working very hard to make sure that folks um, can still learn about the campaign, even though we can't have face to face contact. And I'm assuming that all of the candidates at this point have probably shut down all face to face campaigning, canvassing, door to door, all of that. Yes, everyone thankfully is on the same page, and we're trying to contain the spread by practicing social distancing. So. Um, we are on my campaign. We're checking in with uh, staff virtual uh, via Google Hangout every morning um, and, you know, making sure that people are, you know, are safe and healthy at home. OK. And so you said that's that's with staff. Yes, with staff. And, and then we check in with volunteers as well. OK. Are you are you able to do any kind of virtual town hall or anything like that? Like I'm trying to get an idea of obviously there are the sorts of things that you want to be able to do while campaigning. Much of that is cut off. So how are you adapting to try to get your message out to as many voters as possible? So we're doing virtual town halls okay. um, and our first one is coming up this Friday. Um, and then we're also going to be doing them every single week. Um, we're doing a, a video on Instagram um, every single day, uh, making sure that people are informed about the campaign and can learn more about the campaign. Uh, we're trying to recruit more volunteers. We right now have an active universe of 100 volunteers that are texting through people. Yesterday, we texted about 5,000 people uh, to let them know about the election. Um, our primary election is coming up on May 19th, so it's about two months away around the corner. And so we want people to be well informed um, and making sure that they understand when the election is and how they can vote and who the candidates are. You know, I'm curious, I, I assume, like, so when I'm putting together my rundowns for the show, basically all of the news, like 99% of the news is obviously about the pandemic. Um, I'm assuming that when you're talking with voters, probably that's, you know, by far most of what they're thinking about. And so, you know, you, you obviously, I'm sure you have some policies you'd like to see implemented to deal with that. And I'd like to hear about those. But you also have a suite of other policies that existed long before the pandemic. So how are you adapting the way that you're communicating with your potential constituents? when there's this one big issue that's driving so much attention? No, absolutely. I mean, people are very concerned about uh, locally what's happening with the coronavirus, like what we're doing to contain the spread, what our governor has been doing, uh, which hasn't been much. Um, you know, prior to this happening, I was, I'm the only candidate in, my, in, the, in the primary that's been talking about Medicare for all, that healthcare is a fundamental human right. And right now, more than ever, folks are paying attention to that because People are worried that if they can get a test, which is very hard to get one in the first place, how they're going to pay for treatment if they um, if, if if they get tested positive. So people are very concerned with that. Um, folks are now being laid off their jobs. My mom lost her job about, uh, last last Tuesday, and she's um, very worried about how she's going to be able to pay her mortgage that's coming up on April first. So you know. Are, are these are the issues that people are talking about right now is how they're going to keep the lights on, how they're going to get uh, put food on the table. Uh, th these are very uncertain times. And unfortunately, um, our president and our, our governor here, Brian Kemp, are showing a total lack of leadership in terms of how, you know, taking this seriously and that, you know, families and working people are, are being hit the hardest by this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we've been talking here on the network for the last week or so about how if a few of these progressive policies like um, Medicare for all 
were already implemented, that would make the transition to dealing with the pandemic a lot easier. I'm curious, are you seeing like an uptick on people's interest in policies like that, considering the severity of the, the, the threat that we're facing right now? Are they are they more interested in potential changes like Medicare for all than they were before the pandemic? People are absolutely seeing the necessity of making sure that everyone is able to see a doctor. Um, folks are now paying attention more than ever to our healthcare system because they're realizing that it's broken. Um, and so people are very concerned about um, how people are going to be able to seek care and the treatment that they need in order to get better. So most definitely, this is on people people's radar more than ever. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so you mentioned that the primary is May 19th. That's two months away. We can't say for sure what things are going to look like uh, in two months. Are there currently any plans, um, any contingency plans for potentially uh, either postponing the election or for switching over maybe to entirely like... Um, like mail-in voting or anything like that? Or is the idea right now still to go ahead with day of in-person voting? So our state uh, actually decided today that we're going to do a massive uh, vote-by-mail election. And so I think it's understood that it'd be irresponsible to ask many people to go vote, elderly people to go vote in, uh, in a time where we have a contagious, deadly virus. Uh, and so... What they're doing now is, um, I just read it about an hour ago, is that they're going to send um, a piece of mail asking people if they would like to request a ballot. So you would have to take this piece of mail, put a stamp on it saying that you want to request a ballot, and then, then they will mail you a ballot, and then you have to mail it back with a, a, another stamp on it. So I'm hoping that people during this time, during this pandemic, have stamps at home. So yeah. I, we're going to have to get very creative about making sure that folks have the means to be able to, to vote easily. Um, and so our, I'm, I'm going to make sure that my team and I um, pay attention to those needs. Yeah, that, that plan that you just sketched out seems like a perfect solution to the problem if you believe the problem is that too many people have been voting in past elections and you want to get those numbers down as low as possible. That's a great way to do it, that people need to send multiple letters in 2020 just to register their vote. Oh,